Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Can Dare, your tribute to pop culture. I am Jeremy Colley. I am Jack Doherty. And I'm Randy Hardenbrook. And we've got another amazing guest for you guys this week. Uh, so surreal doing this show, isn't it, guys? I mean, I, I'm, yeah. I'm a broken yeah, record. I say it every week, <laughs> and I try to say it with different words, but it has to be said because it's the fucking truth. Uh, our guest this week uh, has worked in television, film, and theater. He's been nominated for two WGA Awards for Best Comedy Writing for his work on The Golden Girls and Roseanne. He's a writer and producer on The Gilmore Girls and co-created the Lifetime sitcom Rita Rocks and uh, wrote both of the Brady Bunch movies. I mean, those are films I grew up mm -hmm. with. I don't know about you mm -hmm. guys. I mean, I grew up with the Brady Bunch in syndication, but when those movies yeah. came out, <laughs> kind of hit on a different yeah. chord, didn't they? <laughs> but we welcome director, writer, and producer Stan Zimmerman this week, uh, not only just to hang out and chill, you know, hear some cool stories, but to talk about his new book coming out on February 13th, uh, The Girls, From Golden to Gilmore. Before we get to that, don't forget to find us on Twitter at CandarePod, on Instagram at Canned underscore Air, and uh, if you like what we're doing, want to show a little bit of support, CandarePodcast.com. There's a merch tab. And there's a Patreon tab. I think you guys know what's on, that, what's on each of those tabs, so go check them out if you're interested in supporting us. And um, I also have to mention that our YouTube page is becoming more active. Uh, you may or may not have uh, been able to tell, but I'm trying to pump these episodes as they're recorded now, not only in the audio format, but onto YouTube. So i um, been playing with a lot of uh, video editing stuff and learning how to do it a bit better, get the process streamlined. So, you know, if, if video is for you, check out our YouTube page, just Candare on YouTube or maybe Candare Podcast. I think if you just type in Candare, it brings up a lot of sad cases of people addicted <laughs> to snuff, like snorting yeah. Candare. <laughs> <laughs> Not that that's funny. I feel bad for those people, but you know why we laughed anyway. What, well, Randy, what am I forgetting? Uh, no matter how you're listening to us, if you could give us a like or review on your podcast player of choice, it is so, so helpful. It is. And a uh, huge, huge shout out to evergreenpodcast.com, the network we are so proud to be a part of. But with all that off our chest, let's just jump right over to our conversation with Stan Zimmerman. Stan, I want to thank you so much for taking time to be on our show tonight. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you for having me. So much to talk about with you because you just have so much on your, just so much work you've done over the years, you know, between theater, film, television. I uh, don't even really know where to begin, but I'm going to start when you were a child, where it all started. And oh, where the fade comes in. And yes. <laughs> this is your, your life. <laughs> no. Okay, um, violins playing, go on. Yeah, yeah, well, I had read that at the age of 10, you were running a television network out of your room. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Did the three of you do that? No, uh, I didn't even no. know how that shit worked at 10. That's why I'm so curious. <laughs> yeah, <really. laughs> well, I didn't know how that shit worked either, and most network executives don't know how that shit works either <laughs> as well, which is, which is why we get you know, TV as wonderful as we do. Um, no, I just was obsessed with television and I had variety subscription sent to my house in the suburb of Detroit. I don't know if you know Detroit at all, um, near 10 mile, you know, eight mile. I'm sure you yes. know that. Yeah. The movie. yeah. So, um, I was near 10 mile and, uh, I would memorize all the movie grosses, uh, all the ratings for the TV shows, all the Broadway shows and what theaters they were at. And I just love television. And um, I felt that there needed to be another TV network and uh, through my point of view. And so I created this. I had heard uh, it's about uh, Hughes Network, which was uh, Howard Hughes's company. And right now I think it's actually a, um, a broadband company, Hughes Television Network. Okay. So I was going for the big guns. You know, Howard Hughes was a huge uh, multimillionaire. And I felt that he could support a, um, a young Jewish kid's uh, network in his, his bedroom. And um, so I would make advertisements, uh, HTN, his television network. And um, I would give people shows that I felt deserved them. Like I was a huge fan of fellow Detroiter Lily Tomlin. 
and she would do an occasional variety special every couple of years, which was not enough for my taste. So I put her on a weekly variety show or like the show Taxi was, I felt uh, when it was canceled was too abruptly let go. So I put it on my network. Um, crazy things. Uh, there was a TV show called Love American Style. You're all too young to remember that show, but it was vignettes and they had a vignette called Everything Was Love And, and they had Love in the Good Old Days. And it was a show about um, a 50s family starring Ron Howard. And I had oh, just wow. seen American Graffiti and I was like, I'm going to put the good old days on my network. And then all of a sudden the next year I see happy days on TV. I go running down to my mother and accusing her of breaking into my drawer with my whole <laughs> network late <laughs> and advertisements. Um, but it, it did teach me that, you know, I had good ideas that uh, obviously other people have thought as well. Um, I was never a reader in, as a kid, so I didn't think I could be a writer. You know, in like um, English class, they always gave the best grades to people that wrote these long, flowery sentences with adjectives and shit. Right. I just got like cut to the chase. You know, everything was like, boom. I didn't realize then that was almost training for television. Because in television, especially half hour, you got to be 23 minutes in and out. So mm -hmm. you have to cut to the chase. Yeah. But... At that age, I was getting bad grades in English class. So I was like, well, I'm not going to be a writer. And I didn't read. You no know, kids would come back from summer school, you know, summer vacation. Oh, I read, you know, 12 books. And I'm like, fuck you. I read nothing except my Archie comics. <laughs> and um, uh, so I never thought I would. But I had this crazy idea that I would, I didn't even know what a writing partner was, but I had this idea that maybe there's somebody out there that had, different disciplines than I did, like was a writer and a reader, because uh, I always had great ideas. And so I kind of conjured up my writing partner when I went to NYU to be an actor, but um, I met my writing partner, Jim Berg at NYU, and we started making each other laugh as we were walking down the street. And he told me what he was studying journalism and I was studying acting. And I said, all right, let's hang out. So we went to see a movie. We did get stoned first. Let me put that right out there. And, um, you know, after we said uh, I, we were both obsessed with TV, I said, why don't we write a TV pilot? And we didn't know what the fuck to do with that, but we did. And um, in his journalism class, he had a, a writer's manual book that listed agents. So we sent it out to a bunch and we got a guy that handled uh, newscasters to handle our script. Wow. He got it out to L.A., Oddly, I was working in casting uh, my last year of college at NYU, and we get a call from the agent saying there's somebody at Paramount that really liked uh, one of our spec scripts. Um, the craziest thing, that guy was best friends with my boss in New York. I mean, what are, they, what are the what are they, odds? The I'm odds of that now. were insane. So they had gone to high school in Texas together. So um, we made plans to go out to LA. Um, my writing partner had a wedding or something and I had a friend there. And so we went to visit and, you know, took as many meetings as we could. And um, I was sick of being poor in New York. So I moved out to LA and then Jim came out a few months later and we were poor and we couldn't afford to go to movies or anything. So we just went to free tapings of shows and we saw this, really cool new show and we were writing spec scripts for existing series then and we saw this really cool new show about a bunch of uh drunks at a bar in boston no. and we're like hmm that's kind of our style and so um we wrote one of the first cheer spec scripts and you so know, shit. That, nice. yeah so that show came on the air and then everyone you know, was not popular at the time, but everyone knew it was really well written. Yeah. And uh, there hadn't been a lot of shows like that or ensemble shows. And so I think our script really stood out. So after four, probably not so great spec scripts, this was the one that like, you know. Touched you to the next level. Yeah. And it went from, you know, nobody returning our call to suddenly... We were the flavor of the month. Everyone's taking us out to eat. Agents are saying, you know, we'll get you into Hef's Mansion, the parties. I mean, it was really just like, um, 
Yeah, so I was working at the Vista Movie Theater, which uh, was a revival house and was just bought by Quentin Tarantino. So he wow. Just redid, he redid the whole thing. So that's another little odd thing because he was also, a, you know, a guest star on Golden Girls. So all these weird little connections, I think the older you get, all of a sudden, like, or, um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was working at the Vista Movie Theater as assistant manager. I thought that was show business, but uh, that was just the, the tip of the iceberg. And then we got offered that year, my first year, there are two staff jobs. And we took one. And um, I went to hand in my keys to the movie theater. And they knew Hollywood, so they said, just keep the keys. You know, you, you'll be back. <laughs> and I'm like, I'll keep them, but there's no fucking way I'm coming back here. Um, no, especially not after getting that taste of having an office on on the old MGM lot. I mean, sure. on, how cool is that? I mean, we were nervous as fuck. Jim and I met at the parking structure, and I think we actually probably took shits in every bathroom on the way. <laughs> on the way, have I sworn enough yet? Oh have no, I, you're you're good. You're keep good. going. Keep going. <laughs> keep going, man. <laughs> <laughs> if I reach the limit of uh, shits and fucks, um, <laughs> you'll hear a buzzer. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. But confetti okay. will fall from the ceiling. <laughs> I'm hoping there should be like a tally. Can Steve Knacky at the board? I'll do that in post. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you. I really appreciate that. Um, so this is so freeing. My God. Uh, uh, no, I did a, a, a interview with uh, an Indiana TV station yesterday. And you don't even see the people, which is the oddest thing, but that's a whole other story. Anyway, so, um, yeah, we got our first staff job on a, a show that probably should not have been on television. Uh, it starred Richard Gilliland, who was um, married at the time he's passed recently to uh, Gene Smart. Okay. And he played a, uh, it was produced by the Gordon brothers, Larry and Chuck Gordon, who had produced 48 Hours. Oh wow! So they kind okay. of thought, oh, black and white. We're gonna we're gonna bring that to TV. So they came up with the concept about a white weathercaster on a LA news station who is doing his morning jog down the Venice Boardwalk, and he accidentally knocks over a um, genie bottle, and what pops out? A black hip genie. Yeah, you're gonna buy that show, right? Um, <laughs> It gets worse. Oh, my. He speaks to the newscaster and he says, what would you like? Master. Oh, man. Oh. Yeah. So this show was produced by <laughs> Nikki Haley Productions. Um, that was a topical joke there. Okay. Um, anyway, um, so not all the jokes are going to kill. You know, so, you know, uh, yeah, I guess suppose. You know, I'll take some, I'll take some Ambien and uh, come up with some other jokes. <laughs> Add some canned uh, laughter in post too. Yeah, that, I'd that stay away from the Ambien. That didn't work out for Roseanne. No, it did not. That's a whole <laughs> crazy story too. Anyway, so it was our first show, and um, we had some really cool guest stars. We had Roy Orbison. We oh, had wow. an episode we wrote. Um, we had the genie uh, create other uh, entities, and he became a musical group on Soul Train. And we had Don Cornelius as a guest star. Wow. Oh, cool. hey. That was really cool, yeah. Uh, but the show was quickly canceled, and um, CBS offered us a pilot, and uh, we wrote a pilot script that didn't end up getting picked up. And then we did a couple of freelance episodes. One of them, was for a TV show called Fame, you might remember. Yeah. And um, uh, in then uh, Janet Jackson was in the show as an actress. Yeah. Okay. And our episode we wrote uh, was about what happens when actors get bad reviews. You know, how do you keep going? Um, and in it, uh, Debbie Allen directed the episode, and it was Janet's first music video. So wow. I really. I take credit for her, you know, music video success. Yeah, you know, every everything after that. Um, so <laughs> then we luckily um, got uh, a chance to pitch for this new TV show about four old ladies in Miami. It was not on the air. Um, everyone was like, what the hell is that show? That'll never go. And we got, uh, <clears throat> they liked an idea of ours. We, we wrote it pretty quickly. And before the show started airing, they asked us to come on staff for it. 
Which is incredible. Absolutely yeah. incredible. Because uh, going into this, you had to have known who all these women were. I mean, B. Arthur, Rue McClanahan from Maud, uh, Betty White, Mary Tyler mm -hmm. Moore show, Christ. Uh, what were you feeling? I mean, writing and, you know, writing the words that were coming out of their mouths and what they were doing, that had to be very intimidating. I'd, I would be writing for people that I was big fans of already. It wasn't intimidating until I got in an elevator with B. Arthur and it shut and Jim and I are in this elevator and we're like, holy fuck, don't say a word. Don't. <laughs> I, just looked, I just looked down and then I saw just, so she's known for, I don't know if you know this, she doesn't wear like, uh, shoes shoes she wears sandals she doesn't like her feet to be confined <laughs> i read this so in just, your book yeah <laughs> yeah so i'm just looking down at these big feet and i'm just yeah that was scary but i learned <laughs> that she you know it's just actually a very shy sensitive person you wouldn't think that of her um yeah i grew up on all those shows but i i think more than in i mean we wanted to prove ourselves and be funny in this group um Luckily, I didn't know till years later that I guess B saw how young we were, and we were really young. I mean, we we're early 20s. Um, she was like, what are these kids doing writing for us older ladies? Yeah, really? She was not happy. And then she started seeing the scripts, and she's like, they got it now. Uh -huh. And I have to commend, never have I seen this on any show that I've worked on. Every Almost every TV interview you see with them, they always uh give credit to the writers it's not about them they always say if it wasn't for the writers the writers are writers the writers are right writers. i mean that is just not done by people in the in the business um, right. i just wrote a big tv movie for lifetime starring donna mills morgan fairchild linda gray nicolette sheridan and lonnie anderson wow and i went to the Jeez. premiere and i had to force myself onto the red carpet because, you know, I'm just a writer, so go away. And the next day um, on Getty Images, they had all the ladies, and I was guest. <laughs> what? Oh, Come on. Uh, I, we created the whole movie. We created a <laughs> character in it. Guest. Um, so it, in this, after such a long writer's strike, it really hit me hard. Yeah. Uh, just the level of disrespect um, that writers get. Yeah, um, you know, so that's why when people say to me, like, can I, I'll go to these conventions like Golden Girls cons or Gilmore Girls fan fests or cruises for Golden Girls and people come up and say, do you mind if I tell you what the show's meant to me? And I'm saying, I love that uh, because unlike actors that get noticed and people come up to actors and talk sure. to them, nobody knows who I am. So they don't think to talk to me. So when I hear some of these stories, especially with Golden Girls, that they shared with, you know, grandparents or growing up uh, through difficult times and, you know, also especially through COVID, uh, Golden Girls was Hulu's number two view sh viewed show wow. after all these years. Um, I've seen the viewership go up. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Usually your residuals go down and down and down, but now it's played so much that they're actually going up, uh, which is right. crazy. And there was like a huge resurgence. When was that? Like five or six years ago when like merchandise was like action figures and t-shirts yeah. and card games and Lego sets. And it was I, awesome to see. I mean, so, shit, it was in Deadpool for crying out loud. Like, yeah. <laughs> Everywhere. And people start sending me things and like, I have, everything i don't i mean i can only take so many you know jugs of b arthur's head and whatever um <laughs> i do like to have some of the stuff but a lot of it uh, you know i can give away to charity uh but right. it is cool that they are smart enough now to merchandise it but uh, i mean through my career i've seen you know said come they're dead said comes they're back they're dead again oh my god they're back um i i hope more uh you know, multicam shows come back because there was something really cool about being on the stage and you're in the middle between an audience in bleachers and then on Golden Girls, those four women. And I remember standing there and really appreciating. I don't know where I got that, but taking in that moment of, holy fuck, they're laughing at them saying my lines. Right. Um, 
that I'm so lucky to be there. Yeah, you know, I, I worked really hard for it, but there is a lot of luck in this crazy business because um, yeah. there's a lot of people working hard. Um, so you have to be at the right place at the right time. You have to be aggressive, but not too aggressive. Um, you have to completely always be reinventing yourself. You know, when Sid Comes Die, we started writing movies and we luckily got the Brady Bunch movies. Um, right. Then when Sid Comes Die again, we got into uh, writing these movie musicals. Uh, we got offered to rewrite the Annie TV movie that um, Alan Cumming, Kristen Chenoweth, and Kathy Bates did. And then that led to uh, a lot of scripts that didn't get made, but a lot of other musicals, which led to me meeting Priscilla Presley and working on a live musical about her life and getting to go to friggin' um, or fucking on your show. Uh, fucking <laughs> Memphis. That's better. With, hey, there you go. Fucking Memphis with Priscilla Presley. Wow. I mean, that was insane that we had that experience. Uh, the show never happened, but the fact that um, she was giving us a tour around the area, we got there uh, like a day or two early and we found this cool restaurant that was in an old beauty shop. Not knowing at the time when we were eating there, but we found out later that that's where Priscilla got her beehive hair. Oh, oh no way. shit. Nice. When she was in high school. So that's a whole, yeah, that was something illegal going on there. But um, although she says nothing really happened, so um, <laughs> we don't know. Um, but um, so we told her the next day, we said she was meeting us. We said, here's the address. We didn't tell her anything else about it. She walks into this place. Well, they fucking freak out. She <laughs> freaks out because she's like, oh, my God, you know. So it was really, really cool to uh, to bring her there. Um, and then there's a whole crazy story. We went to get notes at her house in L.A. up in the hills one day. And, you know, whoever, her assistant let us in, sat us in a room. We're in this, like, closed room. The door was open to the hallway. And Jim and I are talking. And all of a sudden, both our heads turned toward the hallway. And then we look back at each other. And we said, did you just see what I saw? We both saw some figure, I can only describe like a ghost, <laughs> go by. We both felt it was a ghost. Isn't that weird? Like, I don't really believe yeah. in all that. Watch, oh. I'll, I'll have ghosts at my, at, you know, here tomorrow or tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and Priscilla came back in the room and I said, this is crazy. I don't know how long you've lived in this house, but did Elvis ever come here? And she said, yes. He used to come banging on the front door wanting to see um, uh, his daughter. Wow. So we felt, we both felt, it wasn't just a ghost. It was the ghost of Elvis. It was. What? I know. That's I know nuts. it's weird, but why would two people you know, see the same them? thing? Yeah. Yeah. yeah feel that um so i give that to you <laughs> wow man we should have we, saved that story for halloween we right, always have right yeah. maybe you'll cut it out and play the yeah you know, we'll, we'll, story. <laughs> <laughs> might just have to do that damn i love i loved halloween by the way in detroit i would uh literally turn my house into a haunted house so oh. i had one of those haunted house records i put it the speakers in my upstairs bedroom played it loud for the whole neighborhood. I dressed my mother up as a witch and I would get a big kettle and put dry ice and make her work, you know? Oh, wow. <laughs> so when you say a haunted house, do you mean like just the exterior or did you actually bring people through? We only, well, you couldn't bring people in the house, but they, we had a whole front step and, and a, a garden thing, which I, I put mounds of dirt in a gravestone. And oh, I had so cool. in the big front window, you could look in and there was like at the, card table i had ghosts playing cards i had a ghost playing a piano it was insane um and i created this every year and we were on the news once and just i i did it somehow between 3 30 when i got out of school and dark and <laughs> I, I worked fast. but uh i i had to do it because my mother 
fucking gave out raisins. I said, Mom, Aww. who's going to come? Oh, no. Like, you know, now, <laughs> now I like raisins, but back then I wanted, like, you know, a, you know, a Nestle Crunch Bar or something, you know, sure. to sink no. your teeth in and, and really rot, you, rot, your, rot, rot every tooth you have left. It's like the people that give apples or something like that. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah, we're, we're going to get no traffic with that. So I had to do another thing. I thought quickly on my feet as a kid and like, no, we got to draw them in somehow. You know, so I, I created a, a Halloween extravaganza. Yeah, oh, that's so cool. He's your people, Randy. Yeah, I know. So they walk, I, they walk I, away going, well, at least the house was cool. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> All I got was raisins, but the house was cool. Yeah. Better than getting a rock. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Man. So, so Stan, as a writer and, you know, you've came up with all these, you know, pilots and episode ideas and stuff like that. Have you ever taken like um, parts of something that maybe didn't get picked up and kind of reuse it? Or do you, you know, like, Hey, I'm going to repurpose that later on or. Um, I mean, all the time we, uh, you know, now people look at old scripts and, and can reuse them. Um, when we started out, if a script was dropped, it was in television, it was dead. You might as well just okay. burn it. In movies, occasionally they would find old scripts, but in TV, it was just dead. And we did find, uh, we had written a script on spec um, when um, we loved our time on Roseanne. We loved I, the idea of writing about my growing up of just Midwest living and surviving and that there was just something about you know, riding your bike around the neighborhood and sure you got to be home, you know, by dark, you know, <laughs> yep. now you're probably tracked by your family or something. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we love that about Roseanne. And then we also were obsessed with music. I DJed some parties and, uh, when American Idol first came on, we just like got obsessed with watching that show and, you know, that somebody could be discovered. So we came up with this idea to write kind of Roseanne with music. So it was about um, a suburban mom who um, woke up one day and was like, how did I end up with a minivan and two kids and a dog? Like, I used to be this cool chick in a garage band with my girlfriend smoking pot. <laughs> and um, so we created the show that she takes down her guitar and she starts a band with a garage band with her black um, postal worker, an unemployed male neighbor next door and her daughter's cute um 17 year old boyfriend who plays the drums we wrote it on spec nobody wanted it and then we heard a couple years later that lifetime was looking to finally start developing sitcoms we pulled that old script out we you know we did a little dust off and suddenly they wanted to make a pilot and um wow. so then we started casting and <clears throat> we almost had cindy lopper it. No she, way. Yeah, she had just come off of doing Mad About You and I, she won an Emmy Award for Best Guest Star for it. And she was you know, doing a little bit of acting and she really loved it. And we probably would have had to rewrite it for instead of it being placed in Michigan, where I'm from, we would probably move it to, you know, Long Island in New Jersey or something. Lifetime would not wait for her. Isn't that crazy? That Can is you crazy. Her singing in a friggin' band. Oh, every man. Every couple of weeks. Yeah, that would have been. <laughs> If you've never seen her live, she gives a show. She gives like two hundred percent of all of her energy into every song. It's so sure. emotional. Um, we were really pissed off at them that they couldn't. She was going on uh, to Australia to promote her CD that had just come out. Uh, it's like you're not going to wait for Cindy Lauper anyway. Yeah, that's a stupid it, uh, decision. Stupid, I think. One of the <laughs> stupid, many stupid decisions. Uh, but we got the great Nicole Sullivan, who's friggin' hysterical. And then we got Tisha Campbell Martin from The Martin Show. Okay. And that woman can sing her butt off. And she had cut one album, like early dance album early in her career. And then she was in the mo movie Little Shop of Horrors. But she wasn't really singing anymore. She was just doing sitcoms. And there I was in a recording studio with her every few weeks. And we would just pick cool songs. And, and her and I would just, like you sing this part, you sing, which you would just, we would create it. I mean, it was a dream come true to be in a recording studio, which I really knew nothing about, right. just making cool covers of, of songs I love. And um, yeah, so I, I loved marrying, I just love music. And, uh, you know, back in the day when, if 
you remember Virgin Records? And oh, all that? hell yeah. yeah. Oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they used to have those listening stations. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I keep feeling like I'm just talking about getting stoned, but I used to <laughs> get stoned. It was um, You're in good company. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and go to those listening stations. But I learned so much about music because uh, I would just, you know, get a cart and just yeah. like, try, try everything. And I, have, I still have so much, I can't get rid of those. Um, and then I started collecting LPs just because I love the co- cover art. Yes. Um, but, you know, it was not a bad addiction to have to, to go in, and uh, buy music and, you know, to educate myself on like the history of R&B or just all these artists that I, I didn't know anything about. Um, Do the became- Virgin stores still exist anywhere? The, the one that was in Columbus here closed years ago. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there was, um, Tower Records in New York, in LA and New York, which is a super cool place to, I mean, everybody went there and I would just remember somebody, the first time they took me to it, it was two floors. The top floor was, uh, video cassettes. And so they brought me up there first. And then I looked down and there was like an escalator down to like huge, just racks and racks and racks of CDs. I just, I think I heard like the heavens part and angels sing. <laughs> and I'm like, leave me alone for the next hour and a half. I have some work to do. And, um, wow. and it was, it was really cool. And also like on Gilmore Girls was heavily uh, beautiful music. And we would get free CDs because people wanted all their songs uh, played on the show. So how cool we would go in every day to the producers. Like, can we borrow this? And it was just that whole time of just like really super cool indie bands uh you know that they used on the show and so i just i got every cd possible that's and, uh, cool. and, yeah and then when we made a reader rocks i just said to our producer get us on the list i for some reason getting free music just i didn't care about the show i just wanted free music <laughs> you know? um, that's what was and- kind of cool about uh the virgin stores too because you know not only could you spend so much time in there like you said at the listening station just listening to whatever you wanted but uh, i also remember them having a ton of free uh like singles that you could take like little sample cds i would come even if you didn't buy anything you left with like five different cds I still have them. I, can't I still have some of mine. It's so <laughs> embarrassing. I have like groups like Snap, like Snap X Glam. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just, I, yeah, there's just something about music. And then you, I don't know if you have there, but we had Amoeba Records where you would uh, go and sell them. So I'd go in with boxes of things. And, you know, they would give you, you know, $8.95. I don't care. I had $8.95. And then I would go spend another $80 on, on new music. <laughs> But yeah. I had that eight ninety five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, didn't, we don't have an amoeba. We had like Sam Goodies and stuff. I used to work at a yeah. Sam Goody, and uh, people would bring in their like eighties collection and be like, "Well, okay, I can only give you, uh, you know, like a dollar for this CD." And they'd be like, "Well, whoa, White Snake is worth way more than a dollar, dude." <laughs> right. <laughs> and you go, "I have five hundred White Snakes." Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that was always the weird thing. I'd bring it in, and I think like the cool collection, and they would look and, oh, and they would. Like they make piles. You yeah. Know? And the high pile was like, I'll give you two cents for each of those. And the little <laughs> one. Yeah. That was always, you know, I felt really judged when I would. <laughs> well, I always, yeah. What I would always do though, is like, I'd take their CDs in, you know, look through the computer and see which ones we could and couldn't take how much we give them. And I'd be like, okay, for these 50 CD, CDs, the store is willing to give you uh, like five bucks. But I, personally will give you $20 for all of them and they would take it. So I'd come home with tons of new music. <laughs> I could have probably got fired for that, but whatever. Oh, I, 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 gonna, I think I should report you now, even I know it's, it's <laughs> there's no company, but I think, I think you need to be brought to justice for that. Well, maybe, maybe, I don't know if there's anyone out there willing to do it though. If, if there is come get me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that white snake is mine. Damn it. <laughs> The Sam Goody Mafia show up at your door tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) We'll leave his address at the end of the show. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, shit. Okay. Um, All right. Enough of this. No, I see. This is my favorite kind of episode where I don't even have to look at the notes. We just get to talk and they're my favorite. But um, Randy had said something a little bit ago about reusing 
things that may not have gotten picked up before a later date. And this isn't a great example of that, but you know, using stuff that may have happened in your real life. I was uh, talking to a friend at work yesterday, uh, Karen, Jack, he knows her. And um, I was mm. telling her that you were coming on the show. And she was like, well, who's that? And I said, well, he wrote, you know, for the Golden Girls, Roseanne. And as soon as I said Gilmore Girls, she lit up. And <laughs> yeah. And so she looked you up and we got to talking. And I said, yeah, I was reading in his book about uh, you were talking the story about being on the set of Roseanne and the story about how they uh, her and Tom Arnold made all the writers wear shirts with numbers on them so that they would could just point and say, number three, you're out without having to ever know your names, which is might I say, fucked up. But um, when I told her that story, her eyes got big and she goes, there was an episode of the Gilmore Girls where something like that happened. Uh, did, did you write that into the Gilmore Girls? Because I've no, I haven't personally I, I seen didn't, it. I did not. So the creator of Gilmore Girls and Mrs. Maisel uh, is Amy Sherman Palladino. And we met her on Roseanne. So okay. She had been there. Um, we actually turned down the season one of Roseanne of Staff Job. We were just like, I think they wanted us for like seven, eight years. And I don't know, for some reason, we, we weren't ready to give up uh, the world development of our own shows, but we ended up back on it. Um, so most TV shows maybe have, you know, six, seven to 10 writers on staff. Roseanne that year had 21 writers. Jesus. Holy wow. cow. So Tom and Roseanne, you know, were stand-up comics. So they would meet these crazy funny people on the road, like Norm MacDonald. Mm -hmm. And they would feel bad for them. And they would say, hey, we're putting you on staff. And so these these people, and Laura Keitlinger and uh, Pat Bullard and uh, Stevie Ray Bromstein, and the, a lot of people. And um, so they were making a lot of money and they put them on staff. They were not writers, but they learned to write through the show. And we ended up, you know, having to teach them how jokes had to come from character, not just be joke jokes. Sure. Um, so... Um, yeah, so Tom and Roseanne would, would, they had, we had 21 people. So in the beginning, I think the first day or something, we're in a room with 21 people, well, 20, and we're working on a story about, uh, I think, Darlene, you know, Sarah Gilbert's character. Right. And uh, everybody had figured it out, and we're kind of listening. And then in walks Amy Sherman, and she was just like, no, that will never happen. Darlene would never say that. She would do this, this, this and she, she solved the whole thing in like five seconds. I was like, holy fuck, who is she? Right. So we broke for coffee, and Jim and I like ran up to her and like, who are you? Like, your mind is just like, that was incredible what you just did. And yes, you were right. That was all really fucked up stories that this character would never do. And she just knew the right thing to do. And she just, we instantly clicked. And so she would always, when we break up into different rooms, she says, I want Jim and Stan and Lois Bromfield. You think I've been swearing every other word out of Lois Bromfield's mouth is fuck or some crazy <laughs> shit. <laughs> He's just a filthy lesbian comic who now lives in Germany. And um, very, 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 very funny. And we knew her from before. And Amy would say, you know, we were, they would say, you know, go write these scenes. And Amy would say, get in the car. We're going out to Italian restaurant. Uh, I would be like, no, the writer's going to hate us. We can't go. She said, shut the fuck up and get in the car. <laughs> get, take us over to the restaurant. She'd pay for a bottle of wine. We would, you know, get you know, a little. And uh, we'd come back with these amazing scenes and everybody hated us. But we really bonded with Amy. And, um, you know, then after we left the show, we stayed in touch, went to her wedding. She was really unemployable for a lot of years. And we would really help her out uh, on different pilots and things. And then she landed uh, Gilmore Girls. And um, she had a hard time keeping writers. And then one day she said, meet me at the Chateau Marmont. I don't know if you know what that is. It's a famous hotel. I mean, the sad thing is where John Belushi passed. But oh, um, man. really cool old Hollywood hotel. And she said, come have martinis. And I was like, you have me martinis. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she said, uh, would you come out of development world and come be on staff? I can't keep writers. I'm just, I want some friends there. And so I kind of took it upon myself to make her happy and enjoy. I just couldn't believe she was on a, you know, a well-respected show. It was so smart. 
And why was she fighting with the network and not having a good time? I'm very grateful that I had that opportunity. I met great friends. Uh, we got to write, you know, in a style that we hadn't really written before. Right. Uh, it was an hour show. Uh, Amy liked the fast talking, like those old 40s movies. So she would usually an hour show uh, it takes about a minute per page. So you'd write 60 pages and Gilmore Girls would be 90 pages. That's how fast. Wow. Wow. So that was a lot of words. But uh, it was a really cool experience, and I, and I learned so much. Uh, what Amy did, which uh, most hour shows, you kind of introduce something in that episode and then it's gone. And what she really did was she mapped out the whole season in two chunks, the first half and the second half. But she loved to plant a seed. So if you watch Gilmore Girls, there'll be like a little something about somebody, and then it grows, and then it grows, and it's a whole story. So it's very organic, and it's, it doesn't feel episodic it just feels like right. you're living with these people and loving these people and that was really smart her style was also because her background was in sitcoms usually on our shows it's just little scenes and cut like a movie but she had a little arc to it and she would always end a scene with like a what we call a button or something funny and that's a very sitcom technique you'll notice on sitcoms people come into a room with a joke and leave with the joke Right. Which is kind of an occupational hazard. I now do it in real life and it's kind of annoying to my friends, but <laughs> at least they get a joke in and out of the room from me. Um, but if you watch Gilmore Girls, you'll see there's like a little nice little like joke and it just feels complete each scene. Mm -hmm. I think that's a style that people have really responded to. That's that's awesome. And what a cult following that show has. Wasn't it just a few weeks ago, guys, that uh, we had, uh, was it Loie, Lo Lois and... Uh, Zach, was oh, it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Lois yeah. and Zach, yeah. We were talking about shows, and they're like, have you guys seen Gilmore Girls? They were both all about it, and yeah. they were anxious to talk about it, but we couldn't We couldn't foster that <laughs> in the moment. Well, I didn't really watch it myself. I watched the pilot because I was taught that watch every show at least once. If you want to work in the business, have knowledge about what shows are out there. So I'd watch, and it was also a friend, so maybe watch one or two, but it wasn't kind of my thing, and when you're writing and you're on shows and things, you, you don't really have a lot of time to watch a lot of right. television. So we got the job quickly. And then it was, it was probably like a Wednesday or Thursday, our deal closed. And they said, oh, yeah, you're starting Monday. And back then, I think they were cassettes. Maybe they were DVDs. But Warner Brothers sent us like these long boxes of each season. And I was like, oh, fuck. Well, there's my weekend. So I just, I just... I think ordered food in and sat there and I got transfixed by the story and the characters and it was so so well structured and smart writing. Right. And so by season four I was like, Oh my god, I can't wait to get in there and start writing it. That's awesome. I need to uh jump back a little bit. Um you were talking in the book about damn, my mind just went fucking blank right there, and I don't even know why. <laughs> um does this in happen book? to him often? Yeah, what, it does. What? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the damage it creates, right? Yeah, I know. Once but it's a episode. small price to pay, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it was worth it. <laughs> no, you were talking in your um, book about, you know, how between like uh, Golden Girls and Roseanne, for example, that um, though it was amazing, it was surreal to be working on a hit show that each of those shows had situations that made, you know, working day to day very difficult. So I'm curious how you comfortably walk that line between like total elation and um, anxiety, because, you know, I know everyone has anxiety at work, but not everybody can influence pop culture at work either. Like with, you know, the lesbian kissed episode from Roseanne or, uh, you know, the, the, camera going around the dinner table in the intro to Roseanne. I mean, damn. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, how do you walk or that the line? Brady, Brady Bunch coming up with Sure Jan. I mean, that that's yeah. become a meme that keeps living on and on and on. Um, well, when you're doing it, I'm not thinking of pop culture lasting forever. You know, we didn't, at a lot of the shows, we didn't even know there would be like the internet and things would live forever. It was like right. it was once a rerun and then it was gone. Um, I mean, I feel fortunate to have, you know, been there during all of that. Um, but 
yeah, it's a lot of times like on Golden Girls and Roseanne, that fear of being fired. Yeah. And uh, when we got the job on Roseanne, they said to us, we don't pat people on the back here. And we were, we wanted the job so bad. We're like, oh, that's okay. We, we, don't, we don't need that. Well, you fucking need it. Like, yeah. I learned from bad things or behavior I didn't particularly like how to run a show. Like, no, you would always say thank you. I mean, just in life, if someone comes in, fixes your toilet or paints, you know, a, a bathroom or whatever. I don't know why I'm all bathroom, but <laughs> you say thank you. That's a really good job. Yeah. Like, everybody needs a little bit of like, yeah, I mean, we're working hard and, and you did good. And they didn't do that there. And I, and I thought, well, you're, if you want the best out of these, out of your employees, whatever job it is, you exactly give them a little boost. So I've always learned to do that. And whatever I do, or I'm directing a play, I'm always like, you know, great job today. That was really good. Or, and I'll see, you know, especially in this business, Artists can tend to uh, beat themselves up. Oh, you know, the self doubt and that wasn't any good. And because you do get that a lot, you get a lot of no's and, and people, you know, I've been fired, I've been hired, I've replaced people, everything. Um, that you kind of have to self motivate. Uh, I don't know if you saw Nisi Nash's Emmy award winning speech um, that she did uh, the other night. No. But she talked about. Um, she says, I want to thank myself. <laughs> like, I'm the only one that knows, like, all the no's I got and how hard it was and how I had to keep going and keep putting yourself out there. Um, I talk about that when I teach acting classes. It's show business. So there's a part of, you know, the show part is you have to be vulnerable and open to things. And then there's a business. And you've got to be, like, hard and not take it personally. Right. So we're always like, which hat do I have on? Um and if you have the wrong hat on, it can it can hurt. And I just learned to have a tough skin, but also at the same time, um, be open, have your heart open to putting yourself out there, you know? And it really is, I think, the best work is when you're giving from here. Mm, and yeah. people have said that's the common denominator in our work is that there's a heart to it. And I'm very sensitive about other people and, and the struggles that they go through. And I always think just in real life, um, if I don't know how to handle a situation, I'll think, what would I do if I was in their shoes? Yeah. And that philosophy, I think, has really helped me just appreciate other people and people not like me. And I think that's how we can all find a, a commonality in this world when we're also polarized instead of making people feel other like oh no well, what are they going through what is it like to walk through life either looking like them feeling like them loving like them right. um basically we're still all the same we have all have heart um so that's that, that's my crazy little philosophy but it's not crazy at all i mean I try to That's... live by that kind of, uh, I try to relate to people. It doesn't always work. I, I, I can be quick to rush to anger with people sometimes, but when I have a minute to stop and clear my head, you know. Some of them bring you to it, though. They're... That's true. <laughs> You're right. I'm, I'm on it. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I came from, you know, going to school in New York, and I came to L.A. thinking you had to be hard and rough and judgmental to be funny and caustic. And I realized, no, you know, you can still be funny and really sharp without – hurting people you know yeah. especially as a writer your words have an effect on people and people sure. listen and i learned early on that you can open people's hearts and minds when they're laughing people i think people feel more open you know they're not being preached to they're just you know and we were able to do it in subtle ways like you know uh episodes uh, Golden Girls about uh, Rue McClanahan being propositioned by her teacher. And, um, you know, that hadn't really been talked about much in television and how she wanted to handle it and how, you know, that character would normally want to have sex to, you know, yeah. solve an issue. And this time it just didn't feel right for her. And um, that was cool to do. And um, maybe that was the same episode that you had mentioned in your book came after Rue had come to you and said, you know, challenge my character. 
I, I want to uh, take her, I want to dig into this character, see who she is. And that was season one, very early on. I mean, right. first of all, we're standing there and you see, why is Drew McClanahan like making a beeline for us? And we're just like, oh, we're fired. What, what do we say? <laughs> yeah, we, don't, we didn't know what's going on. And we were just lonely staff writers. But I love that she engaged us because sure. her background was acting. And I didn't realize it at the time. I wish I had. I would have talked to her about it. Uh, I went to a summer theater program in New Hampshire as a teen. She acted at that same theater in New Hampshire as an adult, a young adult. Like, wow. what are the odds of that? Um, I, and I've since uh, been on the Golden Girls cruises with her sister, and I got to share that story with her sister, but I would love to have shared it with her. But she was from the theater, so she, she knew that, you know, in a continuing series, you're always have to delve into the characters and challenge them. And, and she was like, right away, give me, give me a lot. You know, she was, Golden Girls was her first leading role. She was a character actor. So to wow. suddenly have this main part in a show, she wanted to make the best of it and not just, um, you know, give lightweight episodes really. Which she did, really, damn. Yeah, and she did. And so and I think, you know, Susan Harris that wrote the pilot and, a lot of great episodes really created four strong characters that we were able to go in and challenge those four characters. Right. Incredible, man. What an incredible career and just freaking life you've had so far. I'm, I'm so jealous, but damn, all the hard work that comes with yeah. everything you do, you know, it's not just, it's not something that falls in your lap. You've, you've strived for it. Yeah, there was a while there I was working seven days a week right before COVID. I was writing during the week with my writing partner, Jim. And then on weekends, I was writing plays with a different writing partner. And my friends thought I was absolutely out of my mind. But I I just, I, I knew I had to, all this creative ideas and juices were bubbling. And I wanted to take advantage of it. And I also right. wanted to get new material out. And now I'm kind of living the fruits of that because I'm going to different cities where these plays that I've written are now being performed. Um, I may be directing one in Virginia in November. Oh, and wow. so all these new experiences are opening up for me that um, are really cool because I just love being out there and meeting people. And, and again, hearing what my words as a young person, um, how they affected people. Sure. Um, years ago, uh, I was um, uh, shadowing directors. I wanted for a year. I wanted to direct sitcoms, and everyone kept telling me I should do that. And so I shadowed a bunch of directors, and one was on Hot in Cleveland, and that was the Betty White, right? Show, um, Valerie Bertinelli. Um, and so a theater company where I had worked was doing uh, wanted to do a benefit, and they wanted to do a reading of the cast of Hot in Cleveland, reading an old Golden Girl script, and so. Uh, one of the producers who was a friend said, you know, what script would you suggest? I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? One of mine. I'm not going to give you another idea. I'm not, in, what the fuck is wrong with you? So um, they read our uh, Rose's mother, Blanche and the Younger Man script is what it's called. And I have to tell you, hearing those women read it again, I was just so struck with what did I know as like a young 20 year old, guy like to write so those inner feelings of those women right just kind of like, oh, what the how, what where did that come from i don't know um but it was really cool i i did not want that night to end in talking to the great wendy malik and right. just so many people it was uh it was really special and it was interesting betty white did not want to read rose character she wanted to play dorothy b arthur's character Wow. Okay. Betty White, you're Betty White, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I had heard that when they were originally reading for the Golden Girls that um B had read for Rose and uh Oh, it was it was it was uh Rue and and Betty were switched. Rue and Betty, okay. So, yeah, so they thought because Betty White had played the, the sex pop on uh Mary Tyler Moore, Sue Ann Niven, that she should play Blanche. And uh luckily I think it was Jay Sandridge, the great half hour director said, no, let's switch them. And what a genius thing that was. And now you can't even think of them doing it the other way. Yeah. Right. Did you happen to see the uh, episode of hot in Cleveland where uh, 
Mary Tyler Moore came back on along with a few other members of the cast and they did the little mini Mary Tyler Moore reunion. Yeah. Uh, uh, and when I shadowed Georgia Engel was on the show. So uh, I got to spend a little bit of time with her. Um, I shadowed years ago on uh, um, a show that Valerie Harper did. And then right before we got Golden Girls, we got an episode of the Valerie show uh, uh, right before she quit the show or was fired, I guess. Um, <laughs> So I've had little run-ins. I never got to meet Mary Tyler Moore. I wish. I think she was, yeah, you know, just genius. And you know, not only in her show, but before that in the Dick Van Dyke show. Oh and yeah. Watching that as a kid, it was the first time I really saw writers and like, oh, I want to be in a room with them. They look like they're having a lot of laughs all day long. <laughs> uh, otherwise, I I wouldn't have known what a writer really did. Um, right. So, and then she was just, you know, part of her company, uh, being able to create so many really smart TV shows. Um, yeah. And then just seeing her like in a movie, like ordinary people years later, right. um, that, that was amazing. So your book's coming out February 13th, the girls yes, from golden to Gilmore, which we've, you know, a lot of the stories we've been talking about here are, uh, talked about in the book and, uh, a lot more that we haven't talked about, but I'm curious um, what it and is you can that get it now it comes out on the 13th of pre-sales on Amazon and other venues. If you just, you know, Google it, um, you can, you can get it now. So, uh, but you can okay. order it now. We'll arrive on the 13th. And okay. we'll put that link um, in the description to the episodes to help uh, drive people over that way. But um, I'm curious what it is that uh, made you write the book now, because you're still very active. Why not five years from now? Why not five years ago? What is it about now that made you decide you want to put this book together? I started it eight years ago, and I came up with the title. Oh, and I was wow. like, okay. I love it and a good alliteration. So all those G's, just it was like it was it was just you know waiting to be written, and then it was like, oh fuck, well how do you write a book? And then how do you get a publisher? <laughs> so I, I don't know what made me do it, but I thought I'm going to have some accountability here. So one of the first uh, Gilmore fan festivals, which is now called the Fan Fest Society. Anybody interested, your friend needs to come. And I'll tell her about it. it. Karen, are you yeah. listening? Yeah. Every year it takes place uh, on the East Coast in beautiful fall. This year in Connecticut again. Uh, and, and a lot of cast members come and crew members and you get to hang out with Gilmore fans, and we've actually become uh, like a chosen family. And there's a whole group of, of Gilmore fans that follow me to different plays I do or events, and that's been so supportive. Wow, Lovely. it's like the Grateful cool. Dead, man. Like they're following <laughs> yeah. you around the country. <laughs> they're called Zimmer fans. Um, so there, is a, there is a name to it. Um, and But we've been really, gotten really, really close, and it, it, it is super cool. Um, but yeah, so at the festival, I was on stage at a Q&A and I was like, blurted it out, I'm writing a book. And everyone's like, oh my God. And I said the title. And then every year I go back and everybody's like, when's the book? When's the book? When's the book? <laughs> Shit. I did, I did, I did, yeah. um, you know, and I would occasionally, I'll outline it. And then during COVID, I'm like, I'm fucking going to get a publisher. And I got a publisher during COVID. And then I sat there with the uh, sugar-free Red Bull, if you want to. <laughs> You know, I can be an influencer if you want to send me some cases of it. Um, and espresso. And I wrote the damn thing. And um, it was one of the hardest things to do because what I've been, uh, what I did in the book was the, the spine of it is I used journal entries. I've been keeping journals since yes. college. And I wrote a lot during all the different shows. So I pulled all the different stories of those different shows and comparing how I felt as a young person to this ancient person now, uh, how I feel about things. Um, and, um, yeah, so then, uh, the publishers gave me, you know, some great notes and, uh, and then we fought over the cover and, um, and here we are. <laughs> you fought over the cover. Am I allowed to ask what the fight was about? Well, the fight was about the tagline. So the tagline is stories about all the wonderful women I've worked with and Roseanne. <laughs> And uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. I mean, it's true. I would pitch it at the festival, and people always seem to laugh at that. Um, they were afraid if Roseanne saw that and Roseanne on the cover, she might get mad. And I'm going, and the problem would be, yeah, who cares? Um, yeah. 
Um, and uh, so our compromise was Anne Roseanne's on the back cover. Oh, that's why it's uh, like that. Okay. Uh, now you know. Now you know the story, and I'm going to get in trouble. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, Roseanne has a podcast now, so I'd be really curious. Like, should I go on it? What would happen? You know, um, even back then, I always felt like if I just hugged her and showed her love, she would feel better about herself. Right. And everyone on staff was like, do not touch her. Don't. That's wishful don't thinking. <laughs> any radius. It's not a good thing. Um, so I don't know. Maybe I still have that feeling of, uh, I can uh, cure her of her, um, whatever she's going through now. I wish she could harness all that creative energy into more loving and bringing people together rather right now it's just it's, it's filled still with so much venom i don't even yeah recognize that person now yeah at times like this i just go back and rewatch that snickers commercial where she gets hit by the wrecking ball and <laughs> oh my god damn that's a deep cut <laughs> <There you go. laughs> Betty White was in one of those too. Remember, she got, I think it was a Super Bowl commercial. She was yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. got tackled on the football field. I forgot about yeah. that. But yeah. I mean, she had such a great point of view and was really funny. And we hadn't ever seen that before. Um, who can say, you know, right. I, you know, she talks a lot in her books earlier about having multiple personalities and right. mental health issues. And in the book, I talk about the week when she went off to get electric shock. That's yes. what we were told. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't know that. We, that's what we were told. And we had to write her out of the episode. Um, yeah. So, you know, she's had a tough path, but still. And you throw the lambing in there and, and there you go. I can't recommend to people enough to go check out your book. Uh, it's been a great read thus far. I haven't made it all the way through yet. But I'm going to get there and uh, very excited to finish it. Again, we're going to put the links uh, on this episode's notes. Again, you can pre-order it. And uh, February 13th is when it comes out, uh, The Girls, from Golden to Gilmore. Stan, thank you so much for taking time to be here with us today, man. This has been awesome. Great meeting you all. Good luck and thanks for having me. All right, everyone. And once again, that was our conversation with Stan Zimmerman. Damn, that was fun. This is one of my favorite types of episodes where five minutes in, I just brush the notes to the side. You know, <laughs> we just sit there and talk. They are so much fun. It, it is so crazy hearing just people's journeys and like how they got started and just like, yeah, yeah just it, every like little thing that just kind of builds to the next thing. That, that didn't make sense, but you guys got it. What was really cool is seeing, like, we usually talk to the celebrities, voice actors, that they go to cons and they get to experience the people coming up and tell them the stories mm -hmm. of the episodes that they were in and how it affected them. But we actually got to see a writer's get that kind of acknowledgement, too. You never see see or hear that thing, that kind of thing. That's That was kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, I think now, you know, later in his career, he gets th those accolades. But, uh, yeah, like he was saying earlier, definitely, you know, there was a long time where he didn't. And it mm -hmm. seems asinine that that's how it works, because these actors who are getting these accolades wouldn't be having getting them if it wasn't for the writers. You know, the right. writers yeah. are integral. Like, I don't get it. But uh, it's like it's like recently, uh, you know, we went me and Brooke went and saw the Animaniacs in concert thing. And after the show, um, Randy Rogel, Rob Paulson and Maurice LaMarche all came out and everybody was swarming on Rob and Maurice because they were the singers. They're the voices of Pinky and the Brain, etc. Yep. Nobody was talking to Randy. Randy, the guy who wrote and composed all the music you heard. In the movie. Mm -hmm. It's it's nuts. It's absolutely nuts. I don't know what I can do about it. I don't know what we as a collective can do about it, but other than be outraged, but. Hey, just realize it's it's like a band. There's more than just the front man <laughs> exactly. involved. It's a well, hey, they won their strike, so they got their dues. Good, but damn good. <laughs> but 
I want to remind everyone to follow uh, Stan on social media at Zimmerman Stan. Check out his website, ZimmermanStan.com. And again, February 13th, his book's coming out, The Girls, From Golden to Gilmore. Like he was just saying, you're able to reserve it now. We're going to put that link in the uh, episode notes. So be sure to go get your copy reserved. It's a damn good read. And I'm not just saying that because he was on the show. <laughs> if it wasn't a good read, I wouldn't even said I read it. I actually never gave a lot of time to uh, Golden Girls, but I think I'm going to have to kind of dig into that now after talking to Stan and kind of hearing some of these stories. It's that whole Golden that's what Girls. I was kind of thinking of Gilda, Gilmore Girls. That's what I was kind of thinking because I never watched that show. Golden Girls. I know that one. Oh, yeah. I mean, that one we grew up with. But the Golden right. Girls chapter of the book is something else. Uh, we he didn't even scratch the surface of uh, the interactions and the relationships he shared with some of them. Incredible stuff. Can't recommend enough checking it out. But anyway, I'm going to quit harping on that. And uh, Jack, what do we have on the website, sir? Go to cannedairpodcast.com where you can listen, like, follow, subscribe, become a patron, get some merch, see some YouTube videos. And if you'd like to be a guest and promote your work, send us an email on our contacts page. And don't forget to find us on Twitter at cannedairpod, on Instagram at canned underscore air, and on TikTok at cannedairpodcast. And once again, cannedairpodcast.com is where you can find our merch tab and our Patreon tab, two ways for you to support us and get something in return. And uh, once again, if you're listening to the audio version of this, the video is out for it too on YouTube. Go check us out on YouTube. Uh, that We're putting a lot more attention into our YouTube page. A lot of these uh, conversations we have with people are now going to be on YouTube. So check them out. Yeah. I'm excited for it. Yeah, Jack and I did our faces just to look pretty for you. So, you know. Yeah. 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 I was just sitting yeah. here thinking, damn, look how pretty they are. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty. But it doesn't. <laughs> But um, anyway, am I forgetting anything? Shout out to Evergreen Podcast. And uh, no matter how you're listening to us, give us that like and review. Yes, it means a lot. Like and review. But uh, all right. Uh, anything else, gentlemen? I think we're good. I think that's it. That's I think it. that's what we call an episode. So until next time, I am Jeremy Colley. I'm Jack Doherty. And I'm Randy Hardenbrook. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. And be excellent to each other. Yeah.